<laughs> Welcome to Chronosphere Fiction and part two of the season finale of Gafgarn, the Eternally Unfurnished. What's going on, Gafgarn? There are very few things in the world Gafgarn could not explain after witnessing with his own eyes. Why he lost in a fight. He could learn from that. His people's suffering. The crimes the kingdoms committed against them. The land unfairly taken. He could do something about that. Dust. He could avoid it. And all its dry, irritating vileness. Until the boots. He could see what they did. But there was no explanation. Magic was a fable. The evil phantom of Imperium fairy tales made to scare children into proper behavior. A mystifying figment of history's colorful imagination. Something from a millennium ago. Only known in wavering shadows and toothless tales. Until it began walking in his own footsteps. Now he wished this world of the unexplainable had ended down by the wiggle of his toes. Now, he knew of the girl. <clears throat> what? What happened? Gafgarn blinked hard as he returned to consciousness. The haze of his mind cleared to reveal a thick cloud of dust through which he could make out only various nebulous shapes. He tried standing and felt pain in his abdomen. It was a familiar pain, like he'd been hit by a large club. On his tongue loomed the metallic taste of blood and his muddled mind began to register the strain when he breathed. He felt around where he lay and could find no trace of his hammer. He stood, taxed by the painful effort. Images dug themselves out from shallowly buried memory. Sully with her arms raised, preparing a mighty chop to Ursula's whip. Alice was falling. Then, blackness. Not the blackness of sleep or forgetfulness but some kind of actual, alive blackness. Present, absolute, and overwhelming. That couldn't be right, though. Could it? The dust began to settle like a fog in a light breeze. Walls stood to his right and left. He was back in the hallway entrance. As he walked forward, presumably back into the large room, his foot hit something soft and fleshy. Sally! He reached down and picked up a limp arm. After standing straight up, he realized it lacked a body. He threw it aside. Sully! Doran! Oi, boss! What's going on? You mind giving a man a lift? Through the clearing dust, Gafgarn spotted a form sitting against the wall. As he approached, a hand reached out to him. And he grabbed it and picked the man up. Doran collapsed against Gafgarn. Careful there, boss! Only got the one good leg! The other's just a dangler, I'm thinking. Mm, what happened? Someone whooped us good, eh? Who? No idea. Room jumped. Everyone after someone else. Withers girl screamed. And it all went black. Now me legs tore up. Looks like a fleshy broom. Sully! Oi, taking a nap here about, I'm sure. Hopefully looking better than myself. Hard to do with this gorgeous mug, eh, Gaff? Stop talking. Eyes open. Oh, yes. Well, there's some dust. There's some dust. And I, look, I'm a human paintbrush. Shut up. Gafgarn looked back and could make out the flicker of raging fires in the garden outside through the haze. Ahead, a great shadow loomed, a tall, formless mass. As they neared, Gafgarn could make out a pile of rubble reaching up to a great hole where the balcony once stood. The entirety of the back wall had fallen forwards revealing skeletal collapsing innards of the manse. Bits of the roof still hung down from above, the rest lying on crushed furniture and the dead. A thinning of dust above betrayed the specter of a church of the void spire rising in the distance. Pillar supports were splintered and smashed as if crushed through their middles. Alice lay halfway up the rubble, blood and some sickly-looking ichor all around her. He looked down at this jerkin and noticed traces of the Iker as well. Afgarn placed Doran against the wall and began looking for others. He passed a man missing his lower half and then someone missing their upper, an occasional limb minus an owner. Everywhere he looked was carnage like the worst battlegrounds he'd seen, but no evidence of how it occurred. 
All he remembered was blackness. The only trace left of the perpetrator was that Iker, little more than a filmy, colorless slime. He moved to where Wither was last standing and found Harden over Aleda's body. Across from them, Ursula lay under bits of the collapsed balcony. One of her legs was missing from just below the knee, leaving only a ragged memory and a pool of blood. Alive! <coughs> She's breathing! Harden responded. Blood dripped down his face from a wound on his head. His golden locks were drenched. Her shield's busted in. I think her arm's broken. She was up there, so the fall couldn't have done her any good. Something hit her really, really hard. Left this mucus. What hit her? How did this place fall apart? I just remembered darkness. Why can't I remember? Calm down. Sally? I think she's behind me, against the wall. Not too sure. Wither? Rotten bastard dove back into the hall when Alice started falling. I think he knows this could happen. Maybe he was the one trying to stop it. But he could have give us some warning. Afgarn wheeled about and made his way to the body sitting by the wall. Rubbing its head, it was Sully, her face bruised and bloody. She had an ugly gash across her belly, though she didn't seem aware of it. Can you get up? What? Oh, boss. I don't know. How'd I get hurt? What happened? No, no. Anything broken? My head's fuzzy, but I can move fine. Boss, what's going on? Up. Find the others. Grab a weapon. See AJ? Kill him. See Doc? Make sure he doesn't go anywhere. She stood, bracing herself against Scafgarn to keep steady. I don't know how much use I'm gonna be here, boss. The room's still spinning. Oh. Oh. That's a big cut. When did that happen? I'm going to murder that jester. Ursula growled from her spot on the floor. She wiggled out from under the rubble, roaring in pain as she did. She took a spiked belt from a nearby deceased henchman and wrapped it around her leg, just above the wound. She pulled tight, grunting with the effort. Someone gank that girl before she opens that damned pit of blackness again. Wait, what? Blackness? You daft horse-dropping! Withers said as he walked into the room, busted nose bleeding into his curled mustache. Did that oddly adorned agent of chaos teach you nothing? Risk her life? And you repeat calamity, surely losing more than a leg and, oh, yes, the whole of your gang, who seem to have become little more than decor. Allowing her to breathe is a higher crime than I ever committed. She's a monster. She's responsible for this chaos as much as you were responsible for your own unfortunate birth. What was it, Doc? It was evil. Absolute and pure. Amadi, almost untouched but for some bruising and scratches, stood by the massive mountain of collapsed building. Amid the broken dead, her healthy hand on the hilt of her sheathed blade, as she remained a statuesque ode to calm within chaos. Ravenous and hungry from the depths of Morodi itself. This is what your people have wrought. Ordu warned me that something like this I can't believe it. Always prating on about your ebunas and maldis. Someone mind patching up my leg before I lose it? Gafgarn walked Sully over to Doran. She used the clothing from a carcass nearby to wrap Doran's leg. It's Ihuna, our physical world, and Marodai, the lake of chaos it's precariously balanced over. This girl somehow dropped us into Marodai. If only for a moment. Looking around, I'd see it as a judgment of sorts. That's a throat to slit one arm. You know I'm right. Wither aimed a wrist at Amadi. Right. Place a hypothesis, an experiment, if you will. I don't take orders from a one-legged villain. I won't hurt the girl. I couldn't if I wanted to, could I, Professor? We need to get her and leave now. It's the void, isn't it? We were in the void itself. It came from her, swallowed us, and something in it tore everyone apart. Maybe many somethings, Harden added, carrying a groaning, limping Aleda. Her dented shield rested on his back like a shell. Coscadil, Snorgreith, Nishul, Remnagast, their denizens... Alice brought them 
to our world? I spent my childhood learning about and praying to the void gods. Were they really here in the room with us? They're meant to be benefactors, not whatever did this. Your horrid pantheon of the kingdoms. Disgusting. Ludicrous. Aleda croaked. Impossible. <laughs> then a cackle filled the room, pained and crazed. From atop the collapsed mound, a white hand crept over a shattered beam like a sickly spider. <laughs> Behind it rose the laughing, giggling AJ, a face of pure glee, a vision of absolute merriment, even with the side of his head burned as it was. Ash and ember melded with skin into a hideous crust, the hair above curled and singed. Against his white visage, the wound stood out like a bilious obsidian on porcelain. <laughs> Still he laughed, blood trickling across his face. <laughs> Hilarious. He hissed, placing his tattered jester's hat on his head. Burned skin peeled back under it. Wither launched a bolt at him, missing wildly. AJ only grinned even wider, then crawled down the mound with surprising speed and sat above Alice, slipping a knife under her throat. I'll be the one laughing when you're dead at my feet. You felonious thespian! Come now, Teach! You're smart! Don't tell me you can't make up the punchline! Elena unsheathed her sword with a slow, unsteady hand. Hanging limply onto Harden, she looked up at AJ. Nothing, nothing funny about this. You always think it's so funny. Still angry about your girlfriend? You thought I was serious about trading your eye for her life? Years pass, and you still don't get the scoop. <laughs> I loved her. You can't, you can't talk about her that way. You die today, finally. You'd kill the only person in the room who knows what's actually going on, sister. Of course, anyone moves, and we all find out if the girl's nightmare juice works while she's in dreamland. In any case, they shape you all in. You couldn't catch up to me before these explode. AJ held up netting containing those round metallic objects, their wicks lit and sparkling. With a bloody grin, he let them fall. Everyone watched as they rolled down the rubble, coming to rest all around the heap like shining deadly flowers. AJ held one in his hand, resting an elbow on a knee, like a man pontificating on an apple. The grisliest actor in the darkest of plays. I'll have to make this quick before she opens up to us again. This was my gift to you, Gafgarn. A consolation prize for playing along so far. You call all this death a gift? Oh, stop. You relish it. I'd expect you to have more appreciation for such fine carnage. I wasn't too sure what to expect from the little lady, but she didn't disappoint. She helped me take care of an obstacle in our game. Or if Queen of the Streets here survives... We've made it more interesting. It was fun while it lasted, madame. You want to play? Think this is a game? Run now. When I catch up to you, you'll lose all your bits, one at a time. Run now. Oh my, yes. Now that's funny. I'm happy someone here has a sense of humor. <laughs> Where was I? Right, Gaffy. The gift is truth. You can't play the game unless you know all the rules. I've had you at an unfair advantage, I'm afraid. Though I guess that's life. And here. He placed the metal object on the rubble next to Alice's face and reached back to chuck a package at Gafgarn's feet. It was a satchel, plain and unassuming. Now you've got some real dice to roll. What is the game, freak? Don't be like that. We're friends. Caught in the only game that matters. The rest of the kingdom squabble over the poultry and ephemeral. Every life a moment in history's obese enormity. Everyone's so obsessed with the way of things, but you and I, we know what a waste it all is. Particularly after the girl's magic trick. That was strangely lucid. Mm, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the kingdom's insanity. It's so lost in it. Everyone is. You know it. One arm there knows it. Dr. Goldstein III profits from it. You and I, though, in this world run by the blind, we see all too clearly. 
Someone! Just... just kill him already! Imadi, you're fast! No, not as fast as a knife against a monster girl's windpipe. We are at the Jester's mercy. You know I was never a Jester? Not this awful great one, whose ruler wouldn't know a laugh if it bit him in the nethers. I really looked up to the man. Jesters have true power in the kingdoms. They know how ridiculous it all is. And it's their job to tell us, right in the face of kings, in their courts. In those places, powerful people make heads roll. The jesters make us roll. Jesters are the most honest people we know. The only sense this mad world has. That authority runs cities and declares war. That order vouchsafes a way of life. Those shiny things are looking ready to pop. And what a way of life it is, isn't it, Gaffy? There's truth in chaos. You're wearing it on your feet. The kind of chaos that can't be controlled. That reminds us of what we truly are. They all try to hide from it. Pretend they can't line it up in neat rows. But the real ones, you and me, we know all it does, eh? Blow up in their faces. <laughs> I know the kingdoms are ugly. I also know you're stopping me from getting back to my people. Okay, well, here's the thing. I know your secret, big guy. Before all this, you tried to make order out of chaos, too. And now look at you. You made a choice. You want this just like I do. You're better this way because it lets you see behind the world's curtain where the real show is. Boss, I think we need to go. He's going to get us killed. Your dog's got a good leash, big man. Time to get back to playing. By the end, you'll be cured or you'll be dead. In this world, I wonder which is best. What do you think, Cripple? I think I'm out of a business, which means I have all the time in the world for you. Ursula was busy dragging herself out of the room. A henchman dug himself out from under some rubble. His arm hanging limply in a black, bloody hole stood where his eye had been. Most of the meat on that side of his face was torn. He grabbed Ursula by his shoulder and meekly tugged away. <laughs> what fun! We still have a player in the madam. Back to the great game, then. Take the girl. I think in the end, you'll see things my way, Gaffy. AJ released Alice and skittered swiftly up the mound. Wither rushed to Alice, tripping and stumbling as he did, managing another wide shot at AJ. Amadi helped him lift the girl up, kicking away the fizzling metal balls towards Ursula. Meanwhile, Gafgarn charged at the mound. He was careful to place his foot on the remnants of a luxurious chair. The boots did their work, catapulting him to the peak of the rubble. Boss, no! We need to leave! Let's get after him before he gets away. We can't. We're so close. No, darling, you're done. I've never seen those things, but I'm getting the feeling that once those sparks reach the balls, we're all dead. Black hole or no. You'd be right, old boy. Those are grenades. Though I'd sorely love to examine them and figure out how such a cretin got his hands on them. Circumstances as they are, we must. Get out while our skins still cover our bones? Hmm? Wither and Amadi were already at the main hallway. The unconscious Alice draped between their hobbling bodies. Oi, boss man! How about we get our sorry torn horses out of this freak show? Gafgarn roared in frustration, <clears throat> leaping back down to scoop up AJ's package. After shambling outside, the bombs exploded behind them. The crumbling of more of the manse followed. Ahead, the garden still burned. The group carefully made their way to the gate, now with smoldering ruins of splinters. The dead littered their path. Townsfolk and henchmen alike ripped apart like those back in the building. Several more crowded the gate, hanging on its remnants like grisly gargoyles. In the street beyond a mob crowded, huddling behind what cover they could find. Some peering from windows and alleyways, every pair of eyes so impassioned before, now swelled with fear. It was silent but for the flickering of flames and the waving of fox banners. The crowd parted for the group as if a mere torch would set them alight. As they made their way back to the wasted cadaver, streets emptied before them. Upon arriving, they paid little heed to the bodies stacked outside the inn and entered in haste. To the back with the lot of you. Artag ordered, beckoning them into his office. Every inch of the building seemed to be occupied by a person. 
word must have spread quickly as every eye watched the group with fear and wonderment. Encumbered by the unconscious Doran, Gafgarn had a hard time avoiding stepping on people crowding the hall. Not a person stood in Artag's office. However, instead the corners were crowded with his furniture and Gafgarn's group's belongings. A few inauspicious tables occupied the space. Gafgarn and Wither rushed to place Doran and Alice on them. Arden found a clear spot on the floor for Aleda. Moved your things down here. Needed to give your rooms to the folks what needed them. Don't expect any kind of refund. In fact, you all owe me. You're lucky I watched over your crap at all. Since it's your fault, I find my business is now a refuge. The new additions worked wonderfully, Professor. That your lass? Indeed. The rumor's true. You folks opened some sort of abyss? Didn't have her before. Now that you do, and she was there, well, makes a man wonder. Makes the whole city wonder. Wonder what? She's some sort of spook. She gonna bring my place down on top of us? Don't touch her, old boy, and the cadaver may live to be wasted another day. Good. Already fought off enough ruffians keeping the place safe. I don't need some beastie. Just don't touch her. Aye, well, let me fetch a healer or two. You be looking close to death, especially your man there with the leg. I'm surprised to see you so banged up, Elida. You got away. I was so close. We can't stay. We have to get after him while he's close. You hunters are tough. But you aren't chasing after anyone. Not the way you look. Get patched up. All of you. I don't know what you've gotten yourselves into. But I can imagine it's only going to get worse. What happened? Townsfolk are calling the pit stain? It's a bad omen. Pit stain? People what saw it described a pit. Just a hole in the world. Others say that place is now stained by the void itself. Pit stain. I don't name horrifying, unexplainable events. Don't look at me. I don't think anyone's going near there for a long time. It's impossible. A trick. He must have hit me with a bomb, not a black pit. Harden, we have to track him down. We can't give up. Not after everything he's done. Hey, you're the sharp one. Look around. Pick up on some clues already. No one's chasing anyone. You try, and you'll fall right out on the street. In any case, I'll help you get fixed up but only until you're ready to move. I'm sorry to say, I can't have you a lot here. You're too much of a danger. People are scared. Scared people do scary things. The wasted cadaver might be the only safe haven in a city now. It's okay. We'll leave, right? The sooner the better. Good. And Professor? Yes, old boy. Thanks for all your work, but I hope I never see you again. I hope this nonsense takes you all far away from the cadaver. Maybe to a nice remote hole in the ground. Anyway, from the living and breathing. Maybe, for your sake, near a stiff drink. The group left late in the morning. Wither purchased a wagon from Artag. Little more than planks of wood on wheels for Doran, Aleda, and Alice to lay upon. Sully rode Aleda's furry mare. Harden, determined to see his fellow hunter heel, sat alongside with her on the carriage. Along with the Mahdi, they made a sullen caravan. Grim and despondent faces of refugees fleeing the city greeted the party on the main street. Most gave a wide berth to the group. The front gates lay open and unguarded. Gafgarn and Harden had to take a moment to remove detritus that had been used as barricades before the carriage could move forward. They encountered more refugees outside the city on the road heading north. Amadi noticed a group on a distant hill, robes wafting in the breeze, faces in the shadow of hats much like her own. She looked back to the city in sadness, and when she turned again, the figures had disappeared. A cold sweat appeared on her brow as her mind wandered. They traveled the day mostly in silence, a trail of refugees behind them, the faint smell of smoke wafting in a dreary breeze. At dusk, they came to a lightly wooded area and found a path cut off the main road, leading to the welcoming glow of a campfire. Heading in, they discovered a small clearing where several makeshift tents and a large wagon surrounded the modest campfire. Faces bright with fear regarded them as they entered the clearing. One, a young woman in a cloak, her dark hair falling out of her low, hung hood, appeared familiar. The big wagon behind her, loaded with blacksmithing supplies, it was the woman they'd seen leaving Estherling. She only nodded her head at them, her eyes searching for something lost and hidden in the fire before her. 
the Afghan's group settled in the campground. Arden looked after Elena, careful to find a comfortable spot for her to rest. Her arm, splinted, lay in a sling. After leaving her for a moment, he returned to see her sitting in the dark, her eye patch draped over her broken arm. Her free hand rubbed the scar tissue around her eye socket. Arden sat nearby, loath to leave her and her thoughts alone, but unwilling to interrupt them. Wither dug a mass out of his carriage and got to building a tent for himself and Alice. He never left his still unconscious sister, and even with his slower, off-kilter movements and bandaged head, eyed anyone who came close with suspicion. Dorn remained asleep, still covered by a blanket in the wagon and emitting an audible, ruckus sort of snore. Healers tightly wrapped his leg after cleaning and stitching it. Barring infection, they felt he'd still have use of it, though his gait might suffer. That'll be a great excuse for me to get more naps in. In their traveling, he decided to get an early start. Gafgarn sat by the fire, the mysterious satchel in his great hands. Inside, he found a book, its cover tattered leather, its edges eaten by gluttonous time. The spine was flimsy and threatened to fall apart at any moment. The writing within a messy scrawl by a hand unused to holding a quill. Many pages contained splotchy stains and even the char of light burns, like the abstract art of some slathering beast of fire. Under the book rested two gauntlets of silvery metal. Familiar red lettering, deep and bloody, scrawled amid black pits. Gafgarn placed the book aside and regarded his boots. He touched the gauntlets lightly at first, then upon witnessing an obvious dearth of activity, picked them up in his giant paws. How you doing, boss? Sully asked as she found a seat on the ground next to him. She gritted her teeth with the effort. <clears throat> he grunted noncommittedly, though he winced with the way the sound made his sore chest huff. You should get some rest. It's going to take some time for all of us to get back from this. We can, after what happened. We still don't know what happened. Right. Withers got some answering to do, I guess. Don't guess. No. He will answer for this. We're still going to work with him? He promised to help, after all. Yes. Time for his end of the deal. What are you going to do with those? You're not going to put them on, are you? Imagine what they might do, considering the boots. No, not yet. They hadn't noticed the young blacksmith staring at the gauntlets. Or that she crossed the campground over to them and now picked up the book with an impressed whistle. This is the journal of- A book I stolen from a library in Hosto. A copy of some blacksmith's journal, we know. No, you don't. This isn't a copy, this is original. It has to be. It's so sloppy, and there's some stuff here I've not read before. The way it's signed, the charcoal stains. I can't believe that his fingers may have touched this. Never seen someone so excited about words on a page. A voice said from the dark beyond the flame. Everyone turned to look as a bear stepped into the circle. Some of the refugees caused a commotion, moving to get away from the beast. Then they noticed it was a man with a bear fur cloak. The bear's toothy head settled above his forehead. The man melded with his adornment, his face heavy with a beard of the same dark brown hair. His skin was dark like Gafgarn's, making his ice blue eyes stand out like those of a specter. A tattoo, a row of upraised chevrons guided on both sides by small squares, ascended up his face across his left eye. Fearful as his personage was, his face beamed a sense of goodwill that warmed the clearing more than the campfire did. Rogni! Gafgarn stood and the two held forearms before bowing their heads, closing their eyes, and taking a deep breath together. Though Rogni's grin somehow widened, Gafgarn only gave a hint of a smile. I've missed you, my friend. We all do. Wait, you're from the wilds? What gave that away, I wonder? Yes, though you really should learn a country's name. Coming from a place called the Kingdoms, I suppose I'm not surprised. Rogni, you need to go back. I was about to say the same to you, you big oaf. Why do you think I'm here? He's not exiled anymore? Exiled? Sully, no. Yeah, exiled. Your people have decided to take him back? <laughs> Such stories your new friend tells. Sorry, lass. We never kicked him out. What he did, he's a hero. We love the man, though his head turns out to be more stone than flesh. No, I'm sorry to say that Gafgarn here, he exiled himself.
Gafgar and the Eternally Unfurnished is written by Jeremiah French, who just ended Season 1 with quite the cliffhanger. Your narrator and the voices of Gafgarn, Wither, Harden, AJ, Doran, are voice acted by Mike Bethel. Our tag is voice acted by Warren Clark. Sully is Caitlin Curtis, Elata the Hawk, and Ursula the Madam are both voice acted by Julia Eve. Imadi is voice acted by Deborah Cristobal. The blacksmith was Christina Smith. And Alice is Rosanna Jimeno. Your host, production, sound design, and music are Daniel French of Fishbonious Sound Design. So ends season one of Gafgar and the Eternally Unfurnished. Stay subscribed to Chronosphere Fiction and you'll be hearing season two of Generation Z, our western of Outlaws and Lawmen, Corporate Punishment, and more sonnets from the streams. Please keep our writers and voice actors incentivized by contributing at patreon.com slash chronosphere or giving donations on Venmo to at Fishbonius. Until your next listen, keep your cosmos clean.